morning, each one of you. I guess you're awake after that now anyway, so. Welcome this morning. It's a sort of a fall morning. It's a little foggy, but it's clearing out. Maybe we'll get some rain this week. Take your master chorus and turn to 25, and we'll sing, Come Let Us Worship the King. If you'd like to stand, please do. Twenty five in your master course. <laughs> Ninety-two, spring up, oh well. This song is sort of goes back and forth here. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to do your will. And then it's the second time it's teach me, Lord, trust and obey and through the rest of the song. And then we go back and do the first parts again.
I too want to welcome each of you here to our service this morning. Special welcome to visitors. Thanks for being here. I trust that you will be comfortable and feel at home. As a scripture reading, I'm going to be reading from Genesis 2, verses 15 through 24. Genesis 2, 15 through 24. And this is the account of the creation of a woman. And I'm not going to say much because if I talk about women, I'll talk too much and say things I shouldn't say. <laughs> so, but this is the account of the creation of a woman. And it's interesting to me that in the story of creation, with all creation, God breathed into, God spoke and it was created with with. I think, all creation, except a woman. And why is that? I don't know. Uh, so, so the creation of a woman was different. And, and that will come out here in the scripture that we read. And, and I don't have comments after we read it. But um, this is just an, exa- an, an example in this, in this passage, in this account, of God being God. And, and, and so many times, things we can't explain, I just see it as God being God, because God is God, and, and the faith that I have, and I trust the faith you have in God, God is God, and sometimes you can't explain God. So, and it's also an account of God's love for us, and just out of his love for us, the way he blesses us. He blesses us with good things, and that's another example of that. So let's read about the account of a woman, the account of the creation of a woman. Verse 15, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is, good, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, 
That was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you that, uh, thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, for being God. Thank you for the account of creation. And as God, we trust in you. We trust your sovereignty. Uh, We trust your power. We trust you as creator God. We trust you for much more. We trust you, our Heavenly Father, as our as our friend, our father, as our savior. We thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus and the plan that you've uh, brought and, and delivered through your son that we may have life. We may have it more abundantly. We might experience eternity with you. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the account of the creation and, and the good things you've given to us. Thank you for your love that's expressed in this. And uh, just pray, Lord, that we might uh, see you as, as the perfect uh, giver of love as we experience it from you and as we share it with one another. Again, I thank you for each person that is here this morning, and I just pray a blessing on each person. I trust that. Uh, you will be glorified in all we do here in this service this morning. A special uh, prayer for Sherman as he, as he brings us the message, and I just pray you speak through him, through your spirit. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to worship in music again. Take your master chorus again and turn to 147. One hundred forty seven. If you'd like to stand, please do. If you don't, suit yourself.
procedure. With an experience I didn't expect to, please meet Noah and his wife. What a stormy day. Yep, it's raining out there again. How are you? It's raining in here too. <laughs> I'll fix that later. So. Wonder what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. It's going to rain, rain, wind, rain, wind. How much longer is this going to last? I'm sick and tired of being tossed about day and night. This humidity is making my hair frizzy, and on top of that, I can't get rid of this cold. <sighs> Tough day, huh? Seriously. Did so I ever tell you how cute you are when your hair's all wet? Noah, this is not how I imagined our life would turn out. Me neither. My dream was always to marry a wonderful man, have a safe and warm home, and watch our children grow up and run around as we grow old together. Well, you've got the wonderful man part. You better hold on to me, too. I don't think there's too many more of us around. Funny. Seriously, though. This isn't what I expected, either. I mean, I know we weren't planning on building a boat and uprooting our family, going on a trip with all these animals. It just turned our life backwards. And then to top it off, this storm? I want the storm to end. It will. When? Every day is the same. I wake up wet, you go to work and work on the boat, I round up soggy animals and put them in their pens, we never talk or do anything together, and then I go to bed wet and angry. The storm will end soon. How do you know? I, I just trust that it will. I, I know it's been busy lately, but I did remember what today was. What do you mean? It's our anniversary. Noah. I made it myself. It's hard to find stuff to uh, write on on a soggy boat. Roses are red, violets are blue. My heart is flooding with love for you. <laughs> Get it? Flooding? It took me a while to come up with just the right word there. Noah, come here. Sorry about the smell. I just cleaned out the elephant stalls. I'm sorry. I know you didn't plan for things to be like this. I should be more understanding. Babe, we're going to make it. Just remember, you're not alone in this storm. Well, thanks for thinking of me today. I think about you every day. It's just that I don't always tell you. I'll try to remember to pour more affection onto you from now on. <laughs> Get it? Pour? I'm on a roll. I love you, even if you have bad jokes. I love you, too. I promise I won't whine about my frizzy hair anymore. Oh, that reminds me. I have a gift for you. Oh, dear. A shower cap. To protect my hair, thank you. I love you. It's perfect.
Testing, one, two, three, okay, that's my fault, I forgot to turn this on. But yes, thank you again to Noah and to his wife for visiting. You're welcome to come back anytime, and you can bring some rain with you too next time. So <laughs> if we need that. But, and as we uh, transition into this morning's message, let's turn to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Thanks, God, that you are a great God and that uh, you do care and shepherd uh, for your people in all seasons of life. And um, thanks, Lord, that even though we do experience storms, uh, that you are present through each storm. And thank you, too, for the gift of one another and the gift of community that we have. Thanks, too, for the gift of marriage that you've given us. And pray, Lord, that you would speak this morning to your people, that you would build each of us up and that we would hear from you and uh, be more like you and that you would continue to grow to uh, the relationships and specifically marriages within AMC and, and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, life certainly doesn't always turn out the way we think and expect, and there are certainly storms that are part of life, um, but it does help to be able to laugh and have some humor, too, in, in all those seasons of life. So what, what is marriage like? What is the husband-wife relationship like? If you're visiting with us, we've been doing a series on relationships, and this morning the focus is on the relationship between husband and wife, and uh, there's a cartoon up there, and I never really thought of Tom and Jerry and associating them with marriage, but I did see this cartoon here uh, about uh, marriage, and, and this is certainly could be one, one view of marriage, but it reads, husband and wife relationships are like the relationships of Tom and Jerry, though they're teasing and fighting, but they can't live without each other. So is that really an accurate portrayal of marriage? Here's another a slide where a newly married uh, man and wife are sitting beside each other in the honeymoon season of life, and so is marriage more like that picture there, um, or somewhere in between. But we know that uh, just as there's two storms in life, uh, that we experience all kinds of seasons too uh, in marriage as well, um, but God is good, and God has certainly given us a marriage is a gift. Marriage is a, is a wonderful gift uh, that God has given us, but we do live in a fallen world. So because we're fallen people living in a fallen world, that also affects all of our relationships and certainly our marriages as well. So there's a lot of statistics too out there um, about even how fewer people are getting married, and I don't have those on the screen, but was looking at those this week and recently, and um, there definitely is a lower percentage of people, certainly in the United States, that are getting married now than there was even 20 years ago, and it's a substantial difference. Um, and so, uh, again, I think we need to be realistic about marriage, but also to hold it up, as certainly as a good thing uh, that God has given us. But there is uh, certainly different views of marriage, and our expectations for marriage certainly matter. Um, and here's a couple posed from an article that has to do with the expectations of marriage from a recent article on marriage and how our society views marriage. The soulmate model of marriage will most likely fade, and a family-first model of marriage will emerge. So years ago, in some ways, marriage was viewed probably more as a partnership for doing life together, uh, but not as something that where this ideal kind of romance where you're going to live and get married and live happily ever after as kind of a fairy tale kind of thing. So the soulmate models of marriage, which took root in the 70s, rest on the idea that wedlock is primarily about an intense emotional or romantic connection between two people that should last only as long as the connection remains happy and fulfilling. This popular myth is part of why men and women go into marriage with extremely unrealistic expectations, and these expectations then set them up for devastating disappointment. And so there's a Christian author, Gary Thomas, who wrote a book kind of addressing that as well and said that, it kind of raised the question of what is the purpose of marriage? Is marriage to make you holy or to make you happy? And so he uh, focused too on how uh, God can have us grow certainly through marriage, um, but that it's not just certainly about us and, and our happiness. Um, and then there was kind of two... Uh, some ways a reaction to that, and, and uh, again, a, a reminder from, from some counselors and authors that we do need to, to highlight, certainly the positive aspects of marriage, and to, to remind people of that. But the Bible portrays a, a realistic portrait of life, as we uh, read through even Samuel recently, and focused on a sermon series in Samuel, we saw some of the heartaches and 
that people had in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. And so that is part of life too. Um, but uh, we can, uh, by God's grace, certainly enjoy a meaningful relationship with others and certainly with their spouses as well. But Tim Keller comments and put, simply put, people are asking for too much in their marriage partner. And so for those of you who were at the marriage simulcast on Friday, I think one of the speakers pointed out, my marriage or my spouse, uh, my wife makes a great spouse but a poor God. Um, I think sometimes, you know, some of us too look at marriage in that way um, and can look at marriage or our spouse to almost take the place of God and look for happiness in marriage. And ultimately we need to find our happiness and our joy and our needs met in our Father. And as our needs are met in God, then we can have more of a realistic expectations for, for our spouse. Um, but yeah, here's a verse too from Corinthians where Paul speaks uh, about marriage and again points out that there can be bumps in the roads. And he's talking too about being single and he's encouraging actually people to consider being single. And I think as any sermon on marriage, you want to bless too those who are single and, re- and remember that that's an important calling as well. And he says, if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. <laughs> Encouraging verse, right? People usually put this kind of verse on at weddings. You know, has anybody gone to a wedding where that verse was preached? <laughs> I don't think I've ever been at a wedding where that verse was preached. Um, and Paul was a single guy, so I don't know what he had in mind exactly when he's writing this. Um, certainly he was writing again and encouraging people to, uh, if you're single, then you can further God's kingdom in some ways in a different way than if you're married and focus more wholeheartedly maybe on the kingdom of God. Um, but he says too again that marriage is uh, certainly it's not a sin. And uh, obviously uh, from the passage that was read today in Genesis from Tim, we know that God created marriage as a good thing um, and for a man and a woman and, and we'll can look at some of the purposes for marriage as it's communicated in, in Genesis. In Genesis 2.18 it says, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. And so certainly companionship is part of the purpose of marriage. And as uh, you know, Jay Adams, who's written a lot about marriage, argues that companionship is the essence of marriage. And the Bible speaks of marriage as a covenant of companionship. Um, so... Uh, there's that friendship kind of part of marriage where you can enjoy friendship too with a spouse. Um, and that is, again, a gift. But part of uh, the purpose of marriage is certainly to be able to, to work together. Uh, and God had too, as you saw in the passage that Tim read, God told Adam to take care of the garden. Uh, but that was in some ways an overwhelming task for him to do by himself. And so God gave him a spouse to help him carry out God's purposes. And so... Uh, as a married couple, you can work together. You know, we always, as kids often heard this saying, many hands make work light. And there's a beauty in community, a beauty in working together. That certainly extends outside of marriage, but it's part of marriage too. Um, that as a married couple, you can focus together on God and on uh, carrying out His purposes and do that as, uh, as a couple and enjoy uh, fulfilling God's purposes for your lives as individuals and as a family. Certainly filling the earth is another thing, purpose of marriage. You see in Genesis 128, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to increase in number, to multiply. Um, that doesn't happen through friendship. That's part of a unique part of, of marriage. Uh, and then in the New Testament, uh, kind of the classic uh, text on marriage is, is uh, Ephesians 5. And we'll look at that. We'll read that this morning. So I invite you to turn to Ephesians 5. We certainly taught in this passage before, and we're not going to do kind of a verse-by-verse study of Ephesians uh, 5 this morning, Uh, but we do see, too, part of God's purpose for marriage reflected here in Ephesians 5. So I'll start at verse 21 of Ephesians 5 and read through the end of the chapter. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So there's a lot, certainly, in that Ephesians 5 passage here that we could talk about, and one of the things that I want to highlight again, first of all, is uh, that ties into the purpose of marriage. And part of the purpose of marriage is to reflect the kind of relationship that Christ has with the church. And you see that throughout this passage. And, and uh, um, when Paul is addressing the husband, he points out what uh, Christ did for the church, that Christ died for the church. He tried to build the church up, his bride. And certainly that's the attitude that we should have as, as husbands to our spouses. Uh, but also um, he uses... And, and, speaks in verse uh, 31 and 32 about the profound mystery that marriage is. Uh, He says, I am talking about Christ in the church. And so um, even though he's he's talking, he is talking about marriage and the relationship, but he's also talking about Christ in the church. And so again, the relationship between husband and wife is supposed to be a reflection of the relationship Christ has with the church. And so we can communicate to the world, too, the kind of intimacy that God wants to have with people. Um, In the Old Testament, the people of God were often referred to as the bride of God, and that image is used. So God uh, is portraying, certainly too, and using the institution of marriage to portray the kind of intimacy that God wants to have with people. And so again, uh, certainly emotional uh, intimacy and that closeness is a big part of, of the purpose of marriage. And so marriage again is, is a gift, and so that is certainly a positive portrayal of marriage. Yes, there are bumps in the road in life, and yes, there are challenges for whatever season, whatever stage of life you're in, whether you're single, you're married, whatever, uh, however you experience life, you will experience storms and floods, and uh, it's just part of living in a fallen world. Uh, but again, marriage was created certainly as a gift for us. And so how can we, too, cultivate healthy marriages? Um, Because we live in a fallen world, there are bumps in relationships, there are bumps in marriage. Uh, But how can we work on cultivating healthy marriages? Well, at this time, Eric, if you could switch over, there's a couple resources. Uh, As a congregation, we signed up with Right Now Media, and if it works here, we'll switch over to Right Now Media for a little bit. and the simulcast we watched Friday evening, certainly for those who were here, was from Right Now Media. And if you don't have a Right Now Media account and you would like one, you can just email myself or Heather. Um, but AMC on the left panel has a tab there where you can click on that. And then there's some resources listed there for a number of different things. And one of them is marriage and family. And so there's uh, some of the resources uh, are from uh, Les and Leslie Pirate, who they uh, spoke in the simulcast on Friday. Um, love and Respect, which really focuses on the Ephesians 5 model here. And there's a, a lot of helpful stuff in there about how men and women are wired differently. And God, certainly as we love our spouses, we should be a student of our spouse trying to figure out how they're wired and how we communicate love to them. And Love and Respect uh, points that out, that men in some ways need respect more and, and love uh, and women in some ways need love affirmation more. Um, and His Needs, Her Needs is another uh, part of focusing on the uniquenesses of how men and women are wired and how you can fully understand your spouse and communicate love to them in a way that, that they'll connect with. And so those are uh, their books as well. You can certainly read the books, but if you like to watch videos more than read, uh, those are some helpful videos too that you can uh, watch. And uh, we'll refer to some of those too uh, and come back to some of those. But So thanks, Eric. If we could switch back now to the PowerPoint, there's one other resource I'll point out too that I had a book that I read in preparation to for this marriage, for this marriage, for this sermon, and uh, uh, the four habits of joy-filled marriages. And there's a lot of practical stuff in there as well, and it's about 100 pages, and so if you don't like to read a a 200-page book, uh, 100 pages is pretty short. And, uh, but there's a lot of exercises they focus on that I certainly don't have time to mention this morning and a lot of things that I benefited and learned from that that I'm not going to be able to communicate this morning. So I encourage you, too, to pick up that resource as well. 
And they have an acronym that they kind of focus on as being an important part of cultivating healthy marriages. Uh, playing together, spending time together, we'll kind of come back to that. Uh, listening for emotion, uh, appreciate daily, and nurture rhythm. And so uh, that's part of the outline, and uh, they go into that in detail, and they have some practical exercises for each of those areas. And as we think about cultivating healthy marriages, uh, one aspect of creating healthy marriages is honoring one another, to honor our spouses. Romans 12.10 isn't necessarily a passage written about marriage, uh, but in there Paul says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And back in the spring we talked about the one another passages in Scripture, and so this is one of those. Um, but what's it mean to honor one another? Well, if you get married and if, if you said the traditional marriage vows, you promise to cherish each other. So certainly uh, loving involves cherishing each other. Loving each other involves honoring each other. As you, we go through life and as you experience storms and challenges, it can affect our hearts. It can, you know, we can become bitter or angry just over life circumstances. And that kind of thing certainly will impact our marriages too. And so we need to guard our, our own health um, but as we, as we live life um, and as we honor one another, uh, that involves our attitudes, certainly towards our spouse. Um, and our attitudes in life come and go and can be in, impacted by the seasons of life and the storms of life. Um, but our attitude towards our spouse is certainly critical. Um, and if we have, uh, and we'll kind of come back to that a little bit, but if we have an attitude of cynicism towards our spouse, uh, that will undermine uh, certainly relationship. And we will go through lives where we're times and seasons when we're disappointed and it can be tempting to be cynical. Um, but that has to certainly be snipped in the bud kind of thing. And to, and to, we can ultimately choose to be you know, positive or negative uh, with our spouse. And, and certainly uh, by being positive with our spouse is one way of, of honoring them. And here's one quote from the book there um, that has to do with appreciating one another, which is a way of honoring each other. In some ways, marriage isn't that complicated. When appreciation levels are high, your marriage is joy-filled. But when resentment replaces appreciation, marriage feels like a burden. And so as we uh, live life, again, uh, we will experience times when we struggle, times when we go through hard times. Um, but it is, it is important to, to show appreciation to our spouse. And, and appreciation, words of affirmation, is one of the love languages, um, too, that's written about. And so we communicate love differently. Um, but words of appreciation uh, certainly are an important part of life and important part of marriage. And along those lines, narratives are powerful. What you believe about your wife or your husband will have a profound effect in how you treat and feel about him or her. And so if you focus on the negative part of your spouse, and we all do have strengths and weaknesses, and if you focus on the weaknesses of your spouse and you develop, again, cynicism towards your spouse, then it's going to be harder to be positive and to communicate love um, and to feel loving. And so uh, as we... Uh, yeah, as we live life again, I think it's helpful to be reminded of, of marriage and of the different kinds of love uh, in marriage. So, of course, as we think about marriage, commitment's an important part of love. And hopefully that's a 10 out of 10. You're not going to always feel close to your spouse, but uh, we need to certainly be committed to our, our spouse uh, all the time. Um, and there's the service uh, or agape love part of, of love that certainly should be carried out in marriage. And service uh, is another way that we communicate love to people by serving them. And some people receive love better through acts of service. Um, but that should be, you know, constant too. We should serve one another all the time, uh, and we, whether you feel like it or not. Um, and so that's, again, probably a little bit more of a constant. A, a lot of these areas certainly do overlap um, there's the eros, or the romantic uh, part of love. And then there's the emotional intimacy, or the friendship part of love. And the emotional intimacy part of love probably fluctuates the most uh, in marriage of all of those loves. Um, and again, the, that is certainly connected, too, to the, to the romantic uh, love part as well. Um, but as we relate to one another, as we uh, live life, again, uh, our love for one another, our felt love, whether you have feelings of love for your spouse 
will vary, uh, depending certainly on circumstances and that can affect, um, but too, how our spouses are treating us, and there's a lot of things that go into that. So we have up here in front of you, too, a milk can, and you might be wondering, what does a milk can have to do with marriage? Um, well, there's, and I didn't come up with this illustration, there's others, and go back to the book, His Needs, Her Needs, uh, the author there came up with the illustration of love as, as, a, as a tank or as a bank, and you can put positive, you know, you can deposit in the bank, or you can take withdrawals. Um, and so, in the same way, it's kind of a tank here, uh, is another illustration that can apply t- to that, and this was my gra- grandfather's milk can, and it has an X on it, and it has an X on it because it was starting to rust through the bottom, and eventually they stopped using it. But if you look at the bottom, and maybe only the people up front can see it, but there's a couple little spots where it's caulked there to try and repair the holes that were in the bottom of the milk can. And again, eventually it was discarded. But as we live life, certainly you can put things in your love tank, um, and by speaking your, your spouse's love languages, by treating them well, by words of affirmation, uh, and so on. Or you can also put a hole in the bottom of their love tank when you're cynical uh, with your spouse, when you criticize whatever, um, are unkind, that's kind of like blowing a hole in the bottom of the love tank. And uh, I know Harley, who wrote the book His Needs, Her Needs, uh, used the illustration, he said it takes about five positive encounters to overcome one negative encounter, or five positive deposits to overcome one withdrawal. And it uh, certainly probably depends a little bit on what those deposits are and what the withdrawals are. Um, but if you have a hole in a tank, what's going to happen? It's just going to psh- Everything, whatever you put in, is going to go out. And so as we live life, too, I think there's always, in any relationship, there's at least small holes. Um, And relationship takes time. Relationship takes uh, cultivation. And so even in the best of marriages, there's gradual, constant leaks in our love tanks. And we need to be proactive in building up those love tanks. And so I know... uh, Saw recently, too, an advertisement for a seminar or for some material on marriage. And in that, they claimed that in Christian marriages, 85% of husbands struggle with communicating love to their spouses or filling up their love tanks, basically. That's high. Um, That's a high, certainly a high number. Um, But anyway, uh, we do need to be intentional. And so, uh, again, in the resource, his needs, her needs, uh, there's a lot of practical Advice in there in communicating love to your spouse in ways that's relevant to them. And, and one spouse, you can think you can be communicating love, but they may not be hearing it. They may not be uh, receiving it. And so what are uh, some ways that we can communicate uh, or love to our spouses? Certainly words of affirmation are one of those or encouragement. Our theme of the year is encouraging one another. And uh, in any relationship, we're commanded to encourage one another daily. Frequently, And that certainly should be true of marriage as well. But as we encourage one another, that fills up our love tanks. And I can confess that I'm married to somebody whose gift is encouragement, who's one of her spiritual gifts is encouragement. So that's kind of nice. And uh, it's harder to be, get upset with somebody when they're encouraging you and, and rooting for you and have your back. Um, and... So again, as we do that with our spouse, I think all of us are called to that. Whether that's our spiritual gift or not, we are called to encourage our spouses. We're, we're called to build them up. So and in the text here in Matthew or in Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27, we see, too, how Jesus was focused on building the church up. Uh, he was focused on, on bringing out the best in the church. Uh, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or blemish. And certainly he died and gave his own life so that we can be forgiven, so that our sin can be washed white as snow, so that we can become holy. Um, And so love involves certainly sacrifice, and love involves uh, trying to, to look out for the best of your spouse and having their best interests at heart and seeking to build them up, uh, not tear them down as we live life. And so as we invest in our spouse and and attempt to build them up and communicate love in ways that's relevant to them, we certainly will uh, fill up uh, their love tanks, or love tanks will will grow. 
And here's a couple other slides that have to do with filling up uh, love tanks, where there's kind of a gauge on a love tank. How full is your love tank, uh, certainly, uh, for your spouse? And again, that gauge will go up and down, and it'll vary. And this is just another slide uh, that someone else created a, a visual to on love tanks. And you can see, again, the top of uh, water going in and the bottom of water being removed from the love tank. And so, I mean, there's a lot that could be said about positive experience or deposits and a lot that could be said about negative experiences, but there's just a couple highlighted there. Certainly words of affirmation, quality time, uh, understanding, showing empathy, those are parts of a positive experience. And um, negative experiences or withdrawals can include personal attacks, uh, unnoticed efforts, uh, lack of time, and the list really goes on. But as we uh, honor one another, uh, we can certainly do that, again, by valuing each other with our, by our attitude towards our spouse, by encouraging, by cherishing, and by communicating appreciation. And it's, it is interesting, too, that even we can influence our own love tank. I mean, obviously, our love tank is impacted by the actions of our spouse. But how we treat our spouse, the words we say to our spouse, will impact how we feel towards them. It will impact even our love tank towards your spouse. So to some degree, you can control even your own love tank towards your spouse by how you respond to your spouse. Um, but when we communicate love, when you write a note, um, even if you don't feel like it, and if you don't feel loving, if you write an encouraging note, if you speak words of affirmation, and you do that every day for 30 days, the end of the 30 days your love tank is going to feel differently towards the spouse than it did uh, before you tried that. Um, and so simple exercises like that, again, our feelings can impact our actions. And don't wait till you feel like being loving to act loving uh, towards your spouse. And as we, again, act loving and as we choose to uh, communicate love, certainly through words and through gifts and through spending time with them, that even impacts, again, um, our love tank and uh, how we feel about our spouse. And so I think in marriage, everybody wants that. Everybody wants to, their love tanks to be full. Everyone wants to feel loving. Obviously, you know the commitment part should be there and the rest of that should be there. But I think the intimacy part is the part that we often really need to, to work on and focus and continue to, uh, to grow on. And yeah, again, from the skit too, Noah said, I think about you every day, I just don't always say it. I'll try to pour more affection on you. Um, and so it is easy to think about your spouse and not to say anything. And, uh, but we need to be intentional in pouring affection and communicating love in ways that are relevant uh, to our spouse and ways that connect with them. And again, certainly uh, the five love languages are one way of doing that. His needs, her needs. Uh, but another one of the five love languages is quality time. And that's another way that we can certainly cultivate uh, healthy marriages and healthy relationships. So, and uh, again, this is a statement that was made in the skit. Uh, Every day is the same. I wake up wet. This is Noah's wife. You go to work and take care of the boat. I round up soggy animals and put them back in their pens. We never talk or do anything together. And so that's, uh, yeah, any relationship, again, takes... It takes intentionality. It takes time. If you, you, know, you can have a great friend in college and they can move to Australia and you can move to California and whatever. And if you don't communicate at all, you know, yeah, you, 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 know, you have a nice positive memories of them, but the relationship isn't going to continue to grow. Um, and so in order for any relationship to grow, we need to invest time and energy into it. And we do live a busy lives. So part of... Part of... Um, Spending quality time together involves routine. And it was interesting in the simulcast on Friday how uh, they portrayed time and how some of us are planners and we love to plan ahead and others of us are more spur-of-the-moment people who like to just be in the moment kind of and go by the seat of our pants. Um, but certainly we should plan. And it's good, to, uh, it's good to plan love and to get into rhythms, to get into rhythms, healthy rhythms for ourselves and certainly to get into healthy rhythms with our spouses. And so time management is certainly part of uh, spending time uh, and managing our time and being able to have time 
left over, certainly, to give to our spouse. We shouldn't just be giving our spouses the leftovers of our energy and our time. We should save out quality time for our spouses. We don't have a rhythm. And again, this is a quote that comes from uh, the book, The Four Habits of Joyful Marriages. And that we, have, we don't have a rhythm in life that creates margin. Instead, we have a rhythm that creates distance in our marriage and burnout in many areas of our lives. Couples who share joy on a daily basis generally have healthy marriages. It's essentially impossible to have sustained joy in your marriage without a rhythm that includes rest. And so again, there is the challenge to uh, spend quality time every day. Somehow build that into whether it's a morning routine or evening routine or whatever part of your day it is. Certainly as a goal to be able to connect with your spouse and meaningful conversation, meaningful time uh, throughout the day. And again, sometimes we can connect with one another uh, in different ways. And I think, too, even of Jesus and how he connected with the Father. And God obviously wants us to connect with him, too. Um, That same thing that's true with our relationship with our spouse is also true of our relationship with God. If our relationship with God is going to grow, we need to certainly spend time with him as well. But as you look at Jesus, Jesus uh, at times then, too, would go off on a mountain and would spend time us with God just in a concentrated format and yes every day we need to connect with our spouses and, and have meaningful conversation and meaningful time together um, but we also have to carve out <clears throat> those times just like we do for prayer we also have to carve out times with our spouses when we can connect on a deeper level and uh, give a chunk of time uh, we or live in a world where everything's instant, and you can have instant oatmeal, instant this, instant that. But God wants us uh, and to, to develop meaningful relationship with God, to develop meaningful relationship with your spouse, to maintain meaningful relationship with our spouse. It does take chunks of time. And so we need to make that uh, a priority as we live life too, whether it's weekly, monthly, yearly, uh, set goals and, and make, find ways uh, to make it happen. So it's hard uh, to build joy when you feel worn out and lack margin. Perhaps the core reason we lack margin in our lives is that we lack rhythm. Without a relational rhythm, our soul begins to wilt. When we can't find time for the kind of activities that build joy and nurture the soul, life starts feeling overwhelming. So again, too, as we uh, need to build time for our spouses, we also need to, to build time for ourselves. And if we're worn out, and giving their spouses our emotional and our time leftovers, uh, that certainly can impact our marriage or relationship. So one gift we can give to our spouse too is by taking care of ourselves and taking care of our own health and, and managing time uh, for a healthy way for ourselves. You know, even when I was, uh, had an installation service here at, at AMC over six years ago now was, I remember Joe used the illustration of take care of yourself. He said, and he used the illustration of an airplane. When you're in an airplane, they always tell you to put on your mask first. And I think that, that certainly is part of life and part of, of marriage as well, um, to put on that mask and to make sure you take care of your own health. And as we take care of our own health, that again affects the, the health of our relationship as a whole. And so that's part of, of time management as well. And there's a lot that we could continue on <clears throat> certainly this morning with. Um, but we're going to stop at this point. Uh, another way of cultivating marriages, healthy marriages, is using uh, words to build up, not to tear down, and that ties in with honoring one another. But it also has to do, again, even with how we communicate and, and, our, and even conflict resolution and communication. And uh, there's, <clears throat> again, a lot of practical ideas in the... Uh, in the Four Habits of Joy-Filled Marriages. I know in a couple weeks we're scheduled to talk about some conflict resolution, conflict transformation, so I think we'll save some of that stuff for later. Um, but certainly how we <coughs> resolve uh, conflict and communicate, too, is an important part of cultivating a, a healthy marriage, and again, we'll, we'll come back to that at a future time. So life is hard. Uh, But God is good, and marriage, too, reflects life. Marriage reflects ups and downs. Um, But again, it is a gift, and our spouses are a gift. You know, most people, when they get to a point in life where uh, they're closer to death, as you spend time reflecting back in your lives, most people don't say, you know, I wish I would have made more money. Oh, I wish I would have, 
you know, done this more. Uh, they often think about, I wish I would have spent more time with maybe my family or my spouse or whatever. And so I think that certainly as we live life, it's important to, <clears throat> to guard our relationships and to, to invest in marriage. Marriage is a gift. It doesn't always come easy, but it is a gift from God. And so, um, and it's also the foundation of, of, of healthy families, of healthy society. And uh, we need to, to pay attention and to our spouse and to, and to marriage and to taking advantage of the gift that God uh, gives us. And if you're not married to, um, you can continue to serve God and, and enjoy uh, meaningful relationship and friendship in other ways as well. And uh, we'll talk about friendship uh, too next week in that part of, uh, of life, that relationship that God gives us. So thanks, God, for the many gifts you've given us. Thank you for the gift of your son. And thank you for how Jesus lived and died and uh, rose again so that we can experience life in you, that we can experience uh, wholeness, that we can experience uh, redemption, restoration. Um, and thank you, too, that we're not a finished product and uh, that you continue to work on each of us as individuals. And thank you, too, that our marriages aren't finished products either and that we can continue to grow not only as individuals, but we can continue to grow in our marriages. And pray for each marriage uh, that's represented here at AMC. Pray that you continue to uh, to bless each one and that we would continue to grow and have meaningful relationships with our spouses and um, that that would point to the world uh, the beauty of marriage and the beauty of your love to, uh, for us. And again, thank you for, for your depth of your love uh, for us and for the new life and the, and the hope we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn in your life songs to number 266. Number 266 in the life songs, when love shines in. I invite you to stand to sing a song. Jesus comes with power to gladden when love shines in every life that woke and said when love shines in love will teach us how to pray love will drive the gloom away turn our darkness into day when love shines in when love shines in when love shines in how the earth is doomed to singing when love shines in when love shines in when love shines sorrow will grow brighter when love
shines in and the heaviest burden lighter when love shines in tis the glory that will throw light to show us where to go oh the heart shall bless him know when love shines in when love shines in when love shines in how the heart is tuned to singing when love shines in when love shines in when love shines in joy and peace to others singing when love shines in we may have unfading splendor when love shines in and a friendship true and tender when love shines in when earth victory shall be won and our life in heaven begun there will be no need of sun when love shines in when love shines in in when love shines in when love shines in joy and peace to others bringing when love shines in thank you may be seated